Dear Earthmates, we are visiting uh, Andrea Lesic, a, a literary theorist, scholar, and uh, we began our chat a few minutes ago and we've been laughing. Uh, and, uh, uh, and laughter uh, uh, is one of our um, defense mechanisms also and re-energizing ourselves against all odds. Um, and we uh, owe our meeting thanks to Penn uh, Peace Committee and Herman Rojas, our mutual friend uh, from Chile, our uh, international chair. Well, Andrea, you're in uh, Sarajevo. In Turkish, we call it uh, Saray Bosna. And uh, I visited your beautiful uh, city uh, some uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, and um, how did your love for literature begin? Uh, well, I, I grew up in a family that sort of revolved around literature and theatre. Um, my father's side of the family was mostly involved with writing, although my um paternal uncle was also a theater director but he in in the later part of his life he, he mostly sat at home and wrote books with a black cat on his shoulder um and my father was also a literary theorist teaching here at Sarajevo University and my mother's an actress and her side of the family apart from the older generation which came from a, a village in Vojvodina in northern Serbia so they were peasants <laughs> but my mother's family is mostly involved with theater both her She's an actress. Her brother was a theater director. Um, so it it was just the environment I grew up in. And I sort of in in my early teens, I was a very big fan of science fiction. And in a way, I've returned to that. my the book I just finished is is partly on science fiction writers or well, female writers. And then at the age of, I think, 15 or 16, I read Goethe's Troubles of Young Werther and fell in love with that sort of literature. Because previously I thought in my mad science fiction days that I would study astrophysics or something like that. And that would have been a very bad idea. <laughs> but then I um, I discovered that I really wanted to, to read really complex, really interesting literature and analyze it. I never really seriously entertained the idea of being a creative writer. I always knew that I had this sort of distance from literature. I wanted to unpack it. I wanted to see how it works. I wanted to see what made great literature great. So I then went on to study literature and, and I've been, as I said earlier, very lucky to, to be able to make my career in in literary theory to teach it at university i know it's it's a great privilege it's not something that everybody who is good at analyzing literature ends up doing so it's it's been a really very fortunate set of circumstances that amidst all the turbulence of my life and with the bosnian war and everything else i've been able to very steadily almost continuously um develop this this sort of profession. Wonderful. And uh, um, do you uh, now teach at the same time? Are you in, order, in addition yes. to practical uh, research, etc.? Um, I cannot not ask a question about the tragic, uh, of course, uh, uh, war, uh, you know. In, yeah. yeah? And um, well, what would well, you I, say? Uh, what, what I, Sorry. again for for family reasons? I'm I come from a, a what we call mixed family. I'm I'm um, my father was a Croat, my mom's a Serb. Um, we had various family members who married 
Muslims, Bosniaks from Bosnia. So it's a very mixed family. Very good. And, and we always, you know, I mean, I don't see myself as anything in particular. I mm -hmm. see myself as an earthling. Same thing. Um, but what, what was um, particularly tricky about that is that with the breakup of Yugoslavia, because I, I still, to some extent, one of my cultural identities is a Yugoslav. I really see all that region, all, all of those countries as part of who I am. Some regions more than others, but but I sort of see it all as belonging to what my family's past is, what what my still my identity is. And I'm, I have to say, I'm very glad that I feel that my daughter, who never knew Yugoslavia, what is still to some extent feels that way so um with with the war in bosnia which unfortunately even though it could have really united all those who believed in bosnia as a whole as a country that had its own unique identity it split up people into ethnic groups and of course, some suffered more than others. Bosnian Muslims, Bosniaks suffered in greater numbers, were victims of genocide and so on. But everybody was on some level recipient oh, of great pain. Mm -hmm. And for us who don't really belong to any of them or who don't want to belong to any of them, um, the present situation is really very difficult because you, all of the political discourse, all of the um, sort of identity um, institutions revolve around ethnic identity, um, even when they are presenting themselves as being something else. So, for example, we had elections recently, and the really difficult thing that I think all of us on the left, anti-nationalists that are trying to grapple with is that the parties that are nominally anti-nationalist appear to be anti-nationalist until <laughs> that doesn't suit them anymore. Um, so then they make coalitions with, with very right-wing, very nationalist parties, um, depending on what they are. So it's it's um I think the the problem with Bosnia now is that you know the war ended 27 years ago. It ended in 1995. And we are still talking about it. It's the still key event that is permeating political discourse, cultural life, and private lives of people. There's still people who have family members who were refugees then, who stayed refugees. Their whole families who are basically being financially supported by their expatriate um, family members. Um, almost all literary, theatrical film production is centered around memories of the war or post-war trauma. And it's, it's a strange situation where you have an event of a long event, long, tragic, traumatic event of 30 years ago, absolutely determining determining everything else in the present. And you don't see really any way out that is currently viable. And I keep hoping for something that will turn it around, that will make things different, that will change the way even the war is perceived. For example, there were big protests um, by workers who who used to work for factories that were privatized and then um, dissolved or went bankrupt or sold off for parts and, and, and that sort of thing. So this was in 2014. And at that point, it seemed that the political narrative might change into the story of the problems of privatization, of problems of transition from socialism into capitalism, of uh, workers' rights, of... Um, all the corruption that went on. And it was just this blip in public life, in political sphere, and it went away. And that energy that was felt in those protests in 
2014 just dissipated. And frustrations are still there, the problems are still there, but the way of tackling those issues and solving those problems is nowhere to be seen. And it's really difficult because we are stuck in the same frustration, same conflict, same um, completely dead end identity positions that we were 30 years ago before the war. And you don't see any way of breaking that. So I'm, I keep, whenever I talk to, to writers in Bosnia, I keep saying, is anybody writing science fiction? Is anybody writing crime fiction? Is anybody writing generally genre fiction? Because you're all writing about war traumas. And I think quite a lot of people are really fed up with feeling miserable all the time and feeling hopeless. Um, and I think that that some kind of flight out of that sense of we have to remember, we have to remember the trauma, we have to remember the victims. We have done that. It's all there in the institutions, in memory places. In can we now just allow people who are alive to keep living with hope and and the sense that the happy ending is possible? And I think it's it's that's. Now that is a real problem. Of course, you have to remember the victims and, and all of that. But at some point, you have to remember the living. And um, and I think that's, to me, that's the, the most heartbreaking thing that I see um, currently in Bosnia. Well, uh, thank you so much. Um, you presented the situation process extremely uh, well, uh, I'm enlightened. Um, I think uh, we need to be futurist uh, historians. Uh, I mean, what kind of a world do we want? To me, that's the number, of the, the first. Most people, um, first of all, professional politicians focus on uh, the uh, limits of their countries. Um, and then people like us, we are beyond boundaries, we're beyond uh, countries. Uh, we are citizens of the world, citizens of the earth. And, um, and thanks to COVID, more and more people now realize it, uh, that we are on the same planet and mm -hmm. uh, we can solve the big problems only if we collaborate. And that's why Earth Civilization uh, a movement or synergy, um, I, I think, may be one of the realistic utopias. Or actually, that's why I'm uh, I have I have finally devoted, I can say, my life, most of my life, to to this uh, goal, goal path, as I call it. Uh, we we need to. Uh, instead of um, being swollen up by the past, we need to embrace the future without forgetting the present, without forgetting the past, but learning from the past instead of going back and being chained in the, in the past. So that's why I want to consider myself as a, uh, as a futurist historian in a way uh, and act, if we add activism to it then uh, we can be a little bit optimistic and you are an activist at the same time uh, you're on the advisory board of uh, pan international uh, writers for peace committee upon the invitation of herman rojas or, as i said um, I, how about your relationship with Penn? How did that start? Uh, well, that that's also a family story. <laughs> okay. it's, oh. it's, um, because my father was, I, I was not in the war here. I, I was, um, I just started studying in Belgrade because I didn't want to study at the same university my father was teaching. 
um, at. Um, and so the war, when the war in Bosnia happened, I was in Belgrade, which was not at the time the best place to be when the war in Bosnia was going on, but it was still much safer than being in, in Bosnia itself. Um, and so when the war started, my father was one of the people who were uh, founders of Bosnian pen. Um, and it it so I sort of followed what was going on there through through my father. And when I because I was living in in England for about ten years between ninety four and and two thousand and six, twelve years. And then when I came back to Bosnia, um, my father did everything in his power to keep me away from Penn because he felt that again, you know, I shouldn't be part of an organization that um was that he was so closely involved with it would be seen as, as nepotism or whatever but other people were very kind to invite me in and to propose me for membership and um gradually as i became more and more involved um i got nominated to be in the in the board on the board and as vice president so it was a sort of um to a large extent, I knew what was going on. I knew what the issues were. I knew um, how generally PEN worked because my father was for a while also the president of Bosnian PEN. So he, I heard everything that was going on and also the relationship with between Bosnian PEN, international PEN and all the, the issues that might arise. So I kind of used that knowledge that came to me by fate. <laughs> To, to try to activate it in in um helping Bosnian pen function because it's it's um it's an organization that has a quite a lot of members but it's an organization that functions in a country which as I said is full of hopelessness and and lack of faith in in things functioning or, or things being able to to start working properly. So um, I'm currently trying to get as many people to propose things that we could do um, to try to make the best of, of what we can with, with very little money we have. Um, so that's that's my involvement with Penn. Again, family connections. But but as I say, my father did his best not, not, to, <laughs> not to allow me to be too closely involved at least while he was alive. So that was that was my my story with Ben. But I, I love the organization. I think it's probably one of the most positive stories connected to literature I generally agree. in the world. I agree with you. And, and I think it's terribly important to give it give it support both internationally but also on local level. Exactly. I agree with you. I one of my favorite words recently is global the connection <laughs> of global and local i like that i, I mean instead of this uh, and nonsensical dilemma uh pseudo dilemma between local or global oh come on global i mean okay. it's um and um uh, do you secretly secretly uh without yourself seeing it uh, do you sometimes write a few things <laughs> without you know <laughs> your, do you have a parallel life or sometimes yes but it's very private i mean i don't um i think i'm too interested in, in the way literature works to allow myself to fully relax with the idea of what i write in secret being made public but um i sort of feel that it will probably come at some point my my father wrote two novels mm -hmm. in his 60s and mm -hmm. um and both of them came as as a way for him to process his experience of the war and his nightmares really i mean he he <laughs> continued having nightmares because my parents were here for um more than a year and a half during the war 
and um and he w- he was a very sensitive man and and he kept having nightmares and he felt that because there were also sort of all sorts of family tragedies one of my one of his brothers was killed and another died the other died very soon afterwards from heart attack so he had these nightmares and and sense of um also world not making sense that he wanted to to process and it, he did it through through writing novels and actually his second novel which is it's been translated into english by by celia hawksworth who is a wonderful uh translator from my native language uh, which now has various uh versions and various names um and that novel is is his buddhist novel he turned to the buddhist concept of tara or one of the bodhisattvas of of mercy who appears to people according to buddhist narratives were in shape of those who can help you when you most need it and he his way of dealing with with his war trauma was to remember all those people who came at the right time to help and he saw them as incarnations of of this bodhisattva of mercy and i think that there is there something that is this um maybe a family trait of wanting to in in the darkest of times of wanting to find still a way to hope and one of the ways to hope is to remember the good people who were there for you and even sometimes complete strangers um so i at some point probably my life experience will flow into literature but at the moment i am too introverted in my theorist self and too detached from the the nitty-gritty of the creative and publishing process to throw myself in there uh, publishing is another <laughs> you know nobody has to publish anything look at kafka he didn't publish anything that's true uh, that's true uh, the thing is the joy of playfulness uh you know playing uh this uh, that's that's what for me art is a game uh, mm-hmm. a fruitful game a play and uh, the problem is starts when we take it too seriously then we block ourselves w- why not uh, for uh, i enjoy saying that uh, don't be afraid of writing badly don't be afraid of writing foolishly you know and uh, enjoy the ride enjoy the adventure because that the very act of writing enriches oneself and i and i am my own the most important reader for me is myself and for each writer it sh- it is so i think i mean and i don't care what others say really i don't so uh, some people may like it some people may find it foolish so what uh, because i'm i am i feel bored with the um terribly low iq agenda of the world in general and countries in general i mean are we stuck to that low quality uh, mentality no uh, how can we react to it positively by knowing no boundaries to ourselves and the, my, one of my mottos is my i am my mind is limitless my time is not it's very good yes and, and this is true for everybody so if if and but uh, most religions maybe all i don't know uh, or most authoritarian approaches teach us from the beginning uh, they make us think that we cannot we shouldn't dare we there are limitations etc etc well 
I mean, some limitations may be good. Okay, don't kill anyone, etc. But then the rest is control mechanism, authority, with the best of intentions sometimes. Sometimes parents do it. Uh, understandably, with well meaning, you know. And then we have problems. So uh, it's part of uh, a liber li becoming more free. So I, I can I I, I um, don't recommend anything to anyone ethically. But if there is one thing I can say is that express yourself. Don't be afraid of expressing yourself. Writing, especially that's harmless and everybody has a lot to say in all of us there are things express me express me the, the less we express them that want to be expressed the more miserable we feel and uh, so why not write change the names nobody can be offended you express everything let people learn well i i find when when i write this, uh, about literature that that that's a sort of game as well that um i'm i'm not a very serious person i'm i'm um i don't take to the idea of authority very well and i like to take whatever i find useful and play with it so when i'm doing literary theory or when i'm doing literary criticism literary analysis i like to play around and one of the things i find myself very often, um, either people are, it's not just so much that they're criticizing me, but they're a bit taken aback at how um, I find big authority figures in my field not very seriously. So I would either criticize them in, in a way that shows my lack of seriousness towards them or that sort of thing. So, so I see also literary analysis and literary interpretation as something that can be a game. It can be it can be something that you that you can play around with, um, offer completely unexpected interpretation of a work is also a creative creative job. Um, do you know sort of look at all the previous interpretations and say, well, actually, I don't think any of you get it. <laughs> I think this is how it should be going. Uh, so I, I find that great fun. And and that's, to, at the moment, that's my main creative outlet. Um, particularly when it deals with classics, when it deals with sort of canonical literature. Because, you know, there were so many interpretations of, of great writers. But sometimes it's very amusing to take a work that everybody thinks is great and say, well, this sort of thing shows that the author didn't realize that what he was actually doing is something else. Um, and I have to say, I'm quite glad that it seems that my daughter has picked up this trait from me. Um, she read Hamlet about, was it last year? I think it was last year in school. And um, I was very excited for her, you know, her first, encounter with this great play one of the greatest plays in the world and she was so annoyed by Hamlet she called him a man child and was very annoyed that he was seeing his mother as somebody who should stay faithful to her that husband and was very annoyed with him that he was reproaching her for marrying somebody else so that was that was surprising I was a bit taken aback as well but I thought that's yeah that's what I want you to do <laughs> Uh, I, I translated Hamlet into Turkish. Oh, right. it, it is the tenth Turkish translation, published two years ago by Kırmızı Kedi, and um, uh, I had to include a few pieces of information into the speeches. For example, in some societies, such as Turkey, the one in Turkey, uh, usually it is a custom. Uh, to to marry your husband's uh, brother, it is good because that shows solidarity, etc. Mm -hmm. So, but now, how can the audience in Turkey take Hamlet seriously? 
in that sense. Oh, come on, he's, you know. And uh, so I had to, uh, and also people in Turkey, most people do not know that in the Bible and in the Christian tradition, uh, it is a no-no, uh, you know, something like that. So um, I added those little pieces of information to, to make sense of the whole thing. Uh, so uh, that I call, maybe we can call creative trans, uh, translation in a way, N necessarily, you know, uh, a little bit. It is, I prefer the word echoing, actually, N not translating, but echoing. Yeah. You know, no, I, I think it's very interesting you, you say that. I, I also teach a, a course on literary translation. And one of the, the things, when particularly when... Um, translating plays which are meant to be performed on stage and you can't have footnotes that the audience can read exactly it, you you need to to make those interventions otherwise the whole thing is is nonsensical exactly. i i agree with that i think it's fine exactly thank yeah. you and i also added phrases like u-turn and 24 7 or in turkey we call 724 because that is legitimate, because in Hamlet's time, again, a week was uh, seven days and a day was 24 hours. So when Horatio, or at the beginning, one of the, you know, what's going on? People are working day and night, etc. So I said 7.24 or 24.7. And then you turn. Now, there, there were horses and there was the letter U. So yep. what did horses do? I mean, it was a U-turn. So these little things bring, you know, yep. that's why Shakespeare uh, is uh, is uh, in a negative position in England because the British people cannot easily do that. But yep. we are, Shakespeare is more free in other languages, <laughs> in a sense, updating. Okay, well, um, time flies uh, sometimes, at this time especially. Oh, indeed it does. <laughs> I just realized what time it was. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm delighted, of course, uh, to, to have been uh, conversing with you. And uh, uh, my typical question at the towards the end is, um, what would you recommend to younger, you are young, so younger Earthmates? Well, I'm not that young. I'm 50. Um, but I'm 70 now. So um, I think I'm I don't feel that that neither mine nor your generation um, are necessarily in the position to to recommend them anything. I, I have a feeling that that younger people, my daughter is 17, and I feel that on quite a lot of things. She is far more open, progressive, um, forward-looking than I was until she told me those things. Um, so there are all sorts of things that younger generation, I think not everybody, of course, but quite a few of them, um, are very clear about. They're very clear on the need for action about climate change. They're very clear on the idea of um, need for tolerance towards various ways of being a human being. They are very clear on things such as fluidity in gender identity or sexual identity. They are very um, earth-oriented, very cosmopolitan. Through internet, they have possibility which is not always well used but there's a possibility there to learn a lot to be in contact with people from all over the world my my daughter's best friend is a transgender boy in Greece <laughs> um, that she met on Instagram so I think that there is for them I think that they should just do what they now know needs to be done and I think they should just tell us what we can do to support him in that. Wonderful. Yes, uh, I I think uh, uh, parent-child relationship is and should be bi-directional. Uh, 
uh, they also educate us. They help us grow up, our children. Uh, and then uh, we, at the same time, we should not refrain from suggesting or sharing an idea without, uh, you know, uh, any uh, intuition or whatever. Um, and I, I think uh, there is an earth civilization in progress, whether we name it or not, but the, the things you have just listed are exactly what a good earth mate should be, uh, should focus on improving positive synergy, etc. And whether we name it or not, there is a, a positive uh, transition taking place. And the more we can, the more we can add to it, the better. Thank you so much, dear. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure, my dear Earthmate. <laughs> and you too. We're together. Take we care. We are. You too. Yes.